Dark Cast Network, Indie Pods with a Dark Side. It is spooky season, and I am in my prime. I am thriving. I am morbid. I am gothic. I am drinking men's blood and tears out of my coffee mug every morning. (sighs) Yeah, it feels good to be alive. Really quickly before I jump into the episode, shout out to Amber Leah, who just joined the Patreon, and I cannot identify you by name, which is probably good for you, but shout out to the person that just most recently subscribed to the Apple Podcast podcast subscription. Thank you. Love you guys. You guys are the fucking shit. Real quick, if you haven't joined any of those yet with the Patreon, you get exclusive content, all of the archived episodes that I have, as well as bonus content. I chat with you. I have an exclusive Discord community. All the episodes are ad-free. You get discounts for the merch store and a bunch of other fun shit. Honestly, check it out. Patreon F that pod. All right, now let's get spooky. Picture this, you're stepping into an amusement park, which for me is just chef's kiss. It's a place filled with laughter or screams of delight, whichever you prefer. It could go either way, really. And the intoxicating aroma of cotton candy and really just atrociously burnt popcorn fills the air all around. There's dazzling lights from the Ferris wheel. You've got a merry-go-round, which would make me puke. But all of these lights dance in your eyes and they cast these beautiful kaleidoscopic patterns across the night sky. But alas, your eyes catch the flickering sign of an ominous dark attraction, the Laugh in the Dark Funhouse. So you pay your fare and you step into a maze of shadows and very unsettling mannequins. But you notice, swinging from the ceiling, something's different, something isn't quite right. Something doesn't belong. Because what you're staring at is no prop. It's the mummified remains of a man. This is the twisted tale of Elmer McCurdy's life after death. Elmer McCurdy was born on New Year's Day in 1880 in Washington, Maine, to his 17-year-old mother, Augusta, known as Sadie McCurdy. Elmer spent most of his childhood with his mother, his uncle, and his aunt, and a bit later in his childhood, his grandfather. Several historians have speculated that Elmer's father may have been an older cousin, but this is not confirmed. But what is confirmed is that Elmer never knew the identity of his father. Because this case is so old, there's really a finite amount of information, and some of it is contradictory, so I will do my best to give you the most accurate information, but this fucking, this started in 1880. So what can you do? Floppy disks didn't exist back then. Sorry, guys. So Elmer never knew the identity of his father. And because his mother had him so young, Elmer felt like he needed to act as her protector. Now, this next part is unclear. So I'm going to talk about his plumbing apprenticeship. Some sources say that it happened in Maine prior to his mother's death. Other sources say that he went out west and it happened. I don't really think it matters. He was a plumbing apprentice, so it's unclear. But after his mother passed away when he was 20, he decided that he wanted to build a more stable life for himself. And then that's when he decided to apprentice as a plumber, be it in Maine or out west. It's unclear, okay? I'm sorry. Rebellious by nature, Elmer dissented into chaos after his mother's death, and he then developed a really nasty dependence on alcohol that would impact him for the rest of his life, which was not long. His challenges with alcohol use disorder made holding down any job for him from the plumbing apprenticeship and beyond virtually impossible. Elmer moved across the country and eventually he landed in Missouri, where he began working in lead mines. Elmer then joined the army in 1907. And while he was in the army, Elmer took an interest in and trained in the use of firearms and nitroglycerin. But unfortunately, 
I'm sure much to his chagrin, he was really fucking shitty at it. And he was honorably discharged from the army on November 7th of 1910. Now, at this point, Elmer transitioned back into civilian life, but it was here that he made a very critical choice in his life. And that was he was going to pivot into a life of crime. Elmer teamed up with a group of criminals in Oklahoma and used his combined knowledge, or lack thereof, let's be serious, of plumbing and explosives to become a safe cracking, train robbing bandit. But like his experience in the army, Elmer's lack of precision that he had in the army and explosives very much transitioned into his criminal life. I feel like some people have it and some people don't. And maybe he should have just fucking hung up the towel and called it quits because he was just not meant for this bandit lifestyle. While Elmer chose the gangster life, the gangster life certainly did not fucking choose him. But good old Elmer didn't give a shit about any of that. And he decided to make his first attempt as a bandit at robbing a Pacific Express train. The outcome of this heist was obviously to end up with a good amount of cash and belongings that were valuable and they were able to sell for even more cash. However, this is not how it went down. Do you remember how earlier in the episode I mentioned that during his career in the army, he was not good with using nitroglycerin? Well, (laughs) this transitioned into his career as a bandit. Elmer ended up using too much nitroglycerin and he ended up burning up all of the cash that he and his gang were attempting to steal. (laughs) I'm trying not to laugh at this, but it's fucking hysterical. Let's be serious. So obviously the fruits of their labor yielded no fruits. So after his first attempt where he ended up burning all of the cash because he used too much nitroglycerin, Elmer decided he wanted to get back on the horse and try again, but the problem is that pretty much every single heist that he attempted was an absolute disaster. No exaggeration, just from start to finish was just a complete fucking shit show. But what I respect about Elmer is that he was unfazed by this attempt and every other attempt. He was unfazed. So next on the list, he attempted to rob a bank in Chautauqua, Kansas. The problem is that between the last failed attempt and this one, Elmer made no attempt to fine-tune his explosive skills, so there was no attempt to improve them between his last failed heist and this one. Now, this time, in Elmer's defense, he did not burn all of the loot, but his explosives did wake the entire town, which meant that Elmer and his gang were forced to flee the scene empty-handed. But Elmer, who truly embodied the little engine that could, but in criminal form, was not discouraged by his second massive failure, wasn't embarrassed, was just like, this is fine. I'm going to keep it moving. So Elmer decided to orchestrate an absolutely ridiculous train robbery known as the Katy train robbery. And unbeknownst to Elmer, this would be his last. Elmer and his gang conducted the train heist on October 4th of 1911 in Katy, Oklahoma, but just like everything else that Elmer attempted, it did not go well. I'm not really sure how they managed to fuck this up. I'm not a train robber, but they targeted the wrong train, which was a passenger train. So during the heist, they were successful in uncoupling the engine from the passenger car, but because this was the complete wrong train... They only succeeded in stealing less than $50 and a few jugs of whiskey. The heist was supposed to yield $400,000. It is safe to say that this robbery was a disaster, like every other attempt that this crew made at doing something illegal. But the problem with this time is that one of his gang members ended up being captured by authorities. And then that man had turned the sheriff onto Elmer McCurdy and his location. So they gathered a group of people and began to track him by bloodhounds to the Osage, Oklahoma Badlands. 
Now, if you're wondering why there's a group of people motivated to even bother to try to capture this man since he hasn't really accomplished much in the grand scheme of things, I wondered the same thing. And it's because at the time there was a $2,000 reward for Elmer's capture, but he had to have been alive. So the posse that went after Elmer were motivated to do so just for this reward. Now, the head of the group was led by a man named William Floyd Davis, who was the chief of Pawhuska Police in Oklahoma. On October 11th, seven days after the robbery, Elmer was seeking refuge in a barn on Rivard's ranch after the failed robbery attempt. And he was just feeling kind of discouraged. He was also sick. So he's like, fuck it, I'm going to drink all of this whiskey that was seized during the heist instead of the $400,000. And he was just going to hang out there. As I had mentioned earlier in the episode, this would be his last heist. And that's because he's being tracked. He's either going to get kidnapped or murdered by these people, or he's going to die of illness because this dude was insanely sick. I mean, the list is brutal. He had tuberculosis, which would have 100 percent killed him, that he likely developed when he was working in the mines. So mines obviously have really shitty ventilation. This puts miners at an increased risk for the transmission of really any airborne illness, but especially tuberculosis, which is insanely transmissible. I don't know why I just said the word insane so many times. I'm sorry about that. Apparently, I don't have a lot of words in my lexicon this morning. So, But in addition to the fact that it's really easy to transmit diseases because there's no ventilation in mines, there are also elements within the environment of the mine that is conducive to people contracting and spreading tuberculosis, such as silica dust. So yeah, he was screwed. He had tuberculosis. And as if that wasn't crappy enough, he also had a mild case of pneumonia and trichinosis, which he probably got from eating undercooked meat, probably a pig. So without a doubt, he was going to die. Fun fact, since this is over 100 years old, if you're ever reading an old timey book like Wuthering Heights, which is one of my favorites, and you hear of somebody dying of consumption, that is tuberculosis before they knew what the hell tuberculosis was. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. So we have a very sick and very drunk Elmer with a gang hot on his trail that want to capture him for $2,000. Once the gang arrived, Elmer ended up cornered in a hayloft and he swore not to be taken alive. And he was not. Along with the chief of Pahuska police, there was also brothers Bob and Stringer Fenton. Stringer at the time was a U.S. Marshal as well as Dick Wallace, and that was the crew that tracked him to the barn. Elmer McCurdy, a.k.a. the main man, a.k.a. a plumber turned kind of outlaw, was cornered and killed less than three months before his 32nd birthday. One of the men that attempted his capture, Bob Fenton, recounted what happened to the Oklahoma State Register in a story that headlined, quote, Katie Robber pays price of train holdup in his own blood, end quote, where he stated, quote, he took a shot at me first, then he shot at Stringer. Then he took three shots at Wallace before we opened up on him. It took an hour before he dropped. I don't know which of us hit him, end quote. But even though Elmer McCurdy was dead, his story was just beginning. Elmer was dead, and therefore the gang could not claim that $2,000 bounty that they had on his capture alive. Additionally, Elmer had no family or loved ones to claim or look after his body once he had died. So his body was taken by Deputy U.S. Marshal Stringer Fenton, back to Pawhuska, Oklahoma, where he then passed Elmer's body over to the funeral director there, Joseph L. Johnston. This is where things get complicated and also really fucking weird. At the time, law in Oklahoma did protect the rights of unclaimed and or anonymously deceased individuals, but this was not really regulated. And because there was nobody to claim or look after Elmer's body, the funeral director really just had carte blanche to do whatever the fuck he wanted with Elmer's body. So Joseph Johnston decided that if nobody would claim Elmer's body, he would use his body to demonstrate his excellent work, which is really fucking weird. So the funeral director mummified Elmer's remains through a very extensive embalming process And he realized that this body had a certain macabre appeal. So he was like, hmm, how can I use this to my advantage? I know I'm going to monetize it. And he was going to do this by displaying Elmer's body, which is just 
gross and weird. As if it wasn't enough that he made the decision to display this man's body, he was like, I'm going to add on to this. I'm going to dress him up in gangster clothing. He put a gun in his hand and charged visitors a nickel to see the bandit who wouldn't give up. Thus, Elmer's weird journey after death as a sideshow attraction had begun. The funeral director maintained possession of Elmer's remains for five years, from 1911 until 1916. During the time that he held onto Elmer's body, he turned down dozens of offers from people that owned carnivals and attractions. These people obviously saw how the funeral director was using Elmer's body and wanted to do the same. Finally, the Great Patterson Show tricked him into giving Elmer up. The carnival had two of their men masquerade as relatives of Elmer, and they ended up purchasing his body under that ruse. For decades, Elmer traveled throughout the Midwest and West as a quote-unquote freak show attraction. Displaying bodies of dead gangsters and other famous and infamous people was not uncommon during this really strange point in time. So... They took Elmer's body and instead of giving it a proper burial as they promised when they were pretending to be his relatives, they instead made him the feature of an exhibit known as the Oklahoma Outlaw. Over the years, Elmer's body was bought and sold by various showmen and carnival operators and was subsequently displayed in sideshows and carnivals across the country under names like the Outlaw Who Would Never Be Captured Alive or the 1,000-year-old man. Elmer's body ended up in a number of venues, from traveling carnivals to wax museums, and sometimes he was featured in low-budget horror films. It is unclear whether the people who owned or displayed the body were either unaware that it was real or chose to ignore that fact, but based on how exploitative and fucked carnivals and sideshows were back in the day, I would not be surprised if they knew, especially given the bandit nickname they gave him. It just, how would they know he was a bandit from Oklahoma if they thought he was just a mannequin? I don't know. I feel like they definitely knew. It does, however, seem plausible that each new owner perhaps became less aware of the body's true origins. Elmer's embalmed body continued its journey from one sideshow to another and then made a brief appearance to promote the 1933 film Narcotic. By the 1970s, just about six decades after Elmer had passed, his body was moved to California and eventually ended up at the New Pike Amusement Park in Long Beach. By the time Elmer's remains arrived at the New Pike Amusement Park, They were so degraded and coated in several layers of paint and wax from when he was displayed at a wax museum. That staff from the amusement park allegedly mistook him for a mannequin or prop. So Elmer's body was installed in the Laugh in the Dark funhouse where it was supposed to just be another part of the ride. They spray painted Elmer's body in day glow red paint and suspended him from the ceiling in the funhouse. While the new owners of Elmer's body allegedly believed the prop to be fake, I don't think that they thought it was fake, but whatever, one employee grew suspicious after drilling into Elmer's feet, which then produced a yellow, gooey substance. And this employee told them, and nothing was done about it. Nothing happened until 1976 during the filming of the television show The Six Million Dollar Man. During filming, a crew member discovered that Elmer's body was not a prop, it was an actual human. And this happened because the crew member went to move Elmer's body. Something that he did when he was moving the body caused the arm to break off, and therefore they were able to see that there was human bone and tissue in the prop. This discovery obviously indicated that this was not a prop and likely human remains, so they notified the authorities. The Los Angeles coroner's office performed an autopsy and they found a copper jacketed bullet in his chest, along with embalming fluid that was found in the body, 
that they were able to determine was used for autopsies in the early 1900s. The Los Angeles coroner's office then utilized the help of historians from Oklahoma, and they were able to successfully identify the remains as Elmer McCurdy. The first clue was that his mouth was stuffed with carnival ticket stubs from the area. In February of 1977, the city council of Guthrie, Oklahoma, was offered a burial plot in the Boot Hill section of Summit View Cemetery, and this was done to give Elmer a proper burial alongside three other notable Oklahoma outlaws. Obviously, Guthrie recognized this as a chance to promote their city, so they agreed. And two months later, on April 22nd of 1977, a horse-drawn hearse brought a plain pine coffin to Boot Hill, where Elmer was laid to rest finally. To ensure that Elmer's body would not do any more traveling, they poured two feet of concrete over his coffin. And to further capitalize on Elmer in his death, as if that hasn't happened enough at this point, a local bed and breakfast introduced an Elmer McCurdy murder mystery package. I had to re-record that so many times. Try to say that three times fast. Anyway, so they introduced this package complete with a graveyard tour. The story of Elmer McCurdy's life and death is really a morbid tale that I think speaks volumes about human curiosity and the lengths that people will go to for entertainment and to make a couple of bucks. After his life and afterlife of infamy, Elmer McCurdy finally found his resting place, but I think it's safe to say that he won't be forgotten anytime soon. If you liked what you heard today, please like, review, rate, subscribe, all of that jazz. You can find me on all social media at fthatpod, except for Instagram, which is fthat underscore pod. You can find on Patreon at fthatpod ad-free episodes, early releases, archived episodes, bonus content, and much more. And you can find the website at fthatpod.com. 